welcome back to the podcast. Stephanie here along with Maggie. And today's topic is a fun one. Uh, I think we're going to just play this, like, we're going to just chat and things are probably going to, um, we'll deep dive into some of these as we start talking about them. But today's topic is the do's and don'ts, in our opinion, of a, or how to grow your business. Is that the best way to put that title? Maggie, you should Yeah, I think, <laughs> I think, you know, if you're starting a business or you're in a business and you see that there's potential to grow, these things are probably helpful. But if you're just, your intentions in business are just to stay like super small and you don't want to grow, um, this stuff will probably bore you. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, you might you... enjoy it, but it might not atta- like pertain to you in any way. Right, correct. But there might so be we'll some nuggets. We'll start with a bunch of and I have a nice list over here. So this first one, somebody told me from the beginning, it was kind of a business mentor type situation when Stephanie and I were first forming. Oh, you're lovely. Um, and in the last four years, I've heard this since then. So I'm going to pass it along to you guys. If you're starting a growing, you know, starting a business, you think it's going to grow um, or you're experiencing growth right now, you should get in a text relationship with your accountant, banker, and lawyer, because those are going to be your three best friends. <laughs> and currently, we have a very good text relationship with our accountant. We did with our first banker, but he moved positions, and I haven't been in love with any of the new bankers. And then when our lawyer, we've had two lawyers since we've started, and when we need them, we're on a text relationship, but it's not like we can just text them. For no yeah, reason. we don't have a, <laughs> as far as for the lawyer, the lawyer was probably the hardest one for us to, like, we had to get um, referrals from other people and things like that, because it was like, how the heck, like, so I don't, I'll say having a lawyer right from the gate is probably not needed, but once you're in a position that you need one, Having a good, strong relationship with them and them understanding your business is going to help you quite a bit. Um, yeah, I agree. And um, the accountant, honestly, I text with him so much <laughs> that like, if I didn't have that arm of communication, it would make things a lot more difficult. So I do appreciate. Yeah. And I feel like we have really lucked out with our accountant in yeah. terms of he kind of does it all for us. And yeah. sometimes there's there's bookkeepers, there's CPAs, there's payroll. And if you're lucky enough, you might be able to find somebody who's knowledgeable in all of those things. But otherwise, you might have to have them in separate buckets. I know for us, like we started the business with having an accountant. We didn't try to do it ourselves in any way. Um, I've done accounting for businesses, but it's not something that was my full time job for that business. Right. Whereas running a business, it makes it much more difficult. And I would say even, I mean, I did my own taxes when I was just me by myself on my hobby business kind of thing, or the side craft shows, you know, here and there type thing. But once it got serious, it's like, you kind of need to tag team somebody in. Cause well, that segues into another, another do. <laughs> and um, I think, through this conversation, we'll probably be, you know, transparent with you all. So understand how business taxes work because our first year, even though Stephanie and I for combined, probably 20 years combined, we had our own small businesses where it was just us. We were doing all of our things, but this is a whole different thing that happens when you have employees and you're taking loans out for inventory and understand how your business taxes work from the get-go we did not understand until the following year when it was time to file our taxes and we ended up with like a eighty thousand dollar tax bill so our (laughs) advice to you (laughs) is even though like a lot of this stuff we're going to talk about it's it's not interesting it's not fun but if you take the time to learn about it from the beginning, you're going to save yourself a lot of sleepless nights and tears and stuff. Not that we know anything about that, but. (laughs) No, not at all. (laughs) 
All right, I'll go. I kind of skip down to that one because it kind of fit in. So, no, understand how business taxes work from the beginning. Don't just look up YouTube videos. Find an accountant who can explain it to you. And you're going to have to ask specific questions because that's another thing. We did start with an accountant, but I don't think I was specific enough in asking questions. So he, right. it's not like the information was offered up. Right. So make sure whoever And it's one of those with. things that's, I would say it's hard to really know yeah. those questions either yeah. until you kind of go through it. But there's small business groups that you can be part of. There's tax groups, things like that, so that you can kind of be aware. I definitely, like, if we were to do it all over again type thing and the recommendation we had for our current accountant wasn't available, my first thing would be to find an accountant that is has some specialty or understands how online businesses work or whatever your niche is, because that's important too, because they're all handled a little bit different. Like if I had a YouTube career, I definitely would want an accountant that understands YouTube. So I know what's a write-off, what's not, what can I do? What can't I do? So going by recommendations of other small businesses, um, starting to network in your area, there's all these different kind of meetups that you can do networking and things like that. Find somebody that I don't, Maggie and I both go on gut feelings a yes. very large majority of the time. Um, so if you have a good gut feeling about a, a specific person and want to work with them just because you vibe really well, that's a great way too. So put yourself out there, get some of that base work done. And I would, the earlier you can do it is probably always going to be the be- better yes. than waiting until you're over your head and don't know what's going on yet. Yes, like getting an $80,000 pill. <laughs> okay, so um, the next one on my list is, if possible, try to find um, some kind of local business group. And if you can't do that, try to find some online. And so this, for me, in Charlotte, I went through two years of being in a specific business group that's like a worldwide business group. And it was very, very hard for me to join at first because I am an absolute hermit. Um, I don't take this the wrong way, but I, in general, don't really enjoy being around people I don't know. That's I'm saying it nicer than I usually say. You're you're an introvert to the. To I'm the exes, very much an introvert. Basically. I was so nervous the first probably three to six times this business group met. I would get physically ill before the meetings. Now I I loved it, but it didn't mean I wasn't still nervous. But but by the end of the two years, you know, I looked forward to it. I felt great. But what this so entrepreneurship is like extremely lonely in the sense of like even most times your spouses don't really understand what you're going through and you it's not on a daily basis there's situations that like I don't even try to explain so having a business group where you're paired up with people with similar sized businesses and they don't even have to be in similar industries they understand how hard it is they understand employee issues or this or that And for me personally, as a business owner, I cannot stress enough how much being involved in that group has helped our business as a whole and helped both of us as business owners. Huge. Uh, So get yourself out there. You might get physically ill like I did, but it's okay. (laughs) Very proud of you for doing that because it, I mean, that group alone, like whenever we had just a conundrum or like, we would yeah. talk about something. It's always nice to have an outside perspective who also understands business. They might not completely understand our business, but they can right. bring some perspective there that we wouldn't have otherwise had. Um, and it's really, it's really helped us make some very big decisions um, by brainstorming with that group. Um, and sometimes things don't necessarily go the way you know, was expected, but we learned from those. But for the most part, like the amount of knowledge and help and like just 
connection was huge within that group. Yes. And this group, these, so it was, there's multi sections to it. Like there was a small group you met with once a month. And then you met with the large group, which is about a hundred people quarterly. But then there's, there's a WhatsApp channel that's always going. So people are always asking questions. And, and even though I'm not in the group anymore, I'm still in that channel. So I'm still getting like these tidbits of stuff. So put yourself out there. Um, it, it just gets so lonely, yeah. so, so lonely. <laughs> and just having somebody you feel like you can text or call, like really is, you can't put a price on it. So that's yeah. my two And I would say with that. the, I'm going to guess like the question on some people's minds of like, find a group. Well, how do you do that? And I, I mean, Google and Facebook are a really big part for me as far as like searching and finding those things. But there are, you could start small too. Like Maggie is in this group that was internationally known. Like we had to apply and be approved and there were certain standards to be in that group. Not all groups are like that. Um, and not all people need to be in a group like that to get the help that they need. But you can, um, there's so many within your city. Chamber of Commerce. Chamber of Commerce. Go to your Chamber of Commerce. Go to your local technical colleges. Like, check out all those things. Because not everyone is going to have something. But in my experience, like living in Asheville or like back when I was in, you know, Manitowoc. So, like, there is pockets of stuff. So, check Chamber of Commerce. You know, check the technical college. If there's a bigger college, check that out. There will be something. Like, it's unless you live in a town that there's 300 people, you're going to probably be able to find something. Well, and then the hope is that you could find something online that you would be able to connect with. And, and then the other thing I'll say about that when it comes to these kind of groups is you have to put in the time and the effort. You're only going to get whatever yes. out of it, the amount that you put into it, which is why when Maggie joined that, the group that she was in, like I knew that certain days she was not going to be available because it was an entire full day intensive, things like that. Not all groups are obviously going to do that, but you need to take advantage of the things that are offered because otherwise it's not doing anybody any good. So if you're going to join a mentorship program, networking, anything like that, just like everything else we talk about a lot, be consistent, like be active things like that. And you'll, you should at least get some lovely nuggets of knowledge. And once you give it like, you know, a decent amount of time, and if it's not, you're not really getting anything Mm -hmm. out of it, you feel, then you can move on and find a different group, but definitely give it a a good shot to make it work. Moving on to the next topic. Um, This is probably not something we can go, need to go in depth about. I would hope that this is common knowledge, but I unfortunately don't think it is. But you really need to have insurance coverage. And depending on what type of business you have, um, you probably are going to need multiple insurance policies. Now, again, if you're just going to do one farmer's market a week, you know what, whatever. But if you think there's potential for your business to grow, like we have three or four different kinds of insurance right now for our business. So insurance and taxes, you guys, I don't know how much I can pound this in to everybody you really just have to do what you're supposed to do. Your insurance and taxes is not somewhere you cut corners, period. And we don't have to go down the rabbit hole, but it's just very, very, very important. So find yourself an insurance agent. I think we drive hours completely insane. He's the nicest guy. But like, (laughs) you know, find a good insurance agent that specifically deals with small businesses and ask all the questions, ask the recommendations, make sure they completely understand what you're doing. Because even, you know, there's insurance on physical inventory, there's insurance on our digital assets. There's, and I'm not trying to be like preachy and stuff, but like insurance and taxes, you guys don't cut corners. (laughs) You'll get in a lot of trouble. I can go on the, the small rabbit hole about insurance from past experience, even when I had a vintage booth I had insurance because if something was to fall down in that booth and then somebody stepped on a piece of glass or something, who knows, whatever the situation, right? not only will the building probably should have insurance, but just in case if that person decides they want to not only sue the, the building for the injury that happened, but also 
the booth that they were in, I am now covered. I've also had different wholesale opportunities in the past where I had to have insurance um, for them as far as if a consumer then bought it from them and it somehow injured somebody or fell down or did damage, instead of the person suing the company they bought it from, it would come back to the original maker of the item. And then if you're in kids stuff, oh, like God, really, really, really think about it first before you do it, because yeah. it's not so simple of like just putting up some blocks mm-hmm. for a little kid and then not having, there's so much regulation and on that children's products. Stuff, stuff with children's stuff, I want to say about 12 years ago, it really changed. Um, mm-hmm. I, one of my past small businesses was I made handmade dolls and they were beautiful and I was obsessed with it. But in that little window I was making them, I remember stuff changed because I had a friend who made children's wood blocks. And he was like, Maggie, do you have this, this? I was like, what are you even talking about? Yeah. And it just, there was a huge change in the regulations and children's stuff is very tricky. Don't, don't make little wood blocks or like anything really anything. for children. Anything. Unless because there's all these them. different tests you have to go through. Yeah. And like, so be aware of that. Like if that's your passion, that's great. But know yeah. that there's more to it than just making something really pretty and selling it. It, that's just how it is. And I'll say this, and I know that it's said time and time again, insurance is the one thing you pay for that you hope you never have to actually use, yeah. it, which I hate. <laughs> it's also no, a it's nightmare to, to actually it, go through bigger, an insurance claim, but it, the it's bigger one of those things. Is, the more trouble you can get in if you're not insured. And right. you know, there's been a couple times where I've kind of wanted to open up the warehouse to the public, like for events, but I probably will never do it because I don't want to have to file for that kind of insurance, you know? So anyways, insurance, do your research, find a small business insurance agent and just do it. It's not a joke. It's not fluff. You really need to protect yourself. Okay, and I'll say for most people who do craft shows should really be looking into that. If they haven't yet, because some shows require it. They're not going to mm-hmm. ask you for proof of it, but they still, if something happens or like a windstorm comes through and your tent goes flying and all of your stuff is damaged, you probably want to claim that. Like there's other things. See, I, just- I wish I would have thought about that way back because there was one time my tent did blow over. <laughs> And yeah, I wish it happens. This five hundred dollar tent, you know, and it got destroyed yeah. by the wind. And one yeah. more thing about insurance, you guys, it really is not that expensive. I'm talking about yeah. fractions of a penny on the dollar. Like it's it's almost nothing. So it's not this fear. Taxes are way more daunting. Insurance, literally, it's like a tiny little drop in the bucket. You know, I was it doesn't really say. Matter. I think mine was like. 20 bucks or something like exactly. that. Like it was, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Next thing on the list, again, if you think your business is going to grow when you're starting or you're like starting to ramp up, make sure the supplies you need to sustain your business are going to be readily available. Not that you're making, let's just use kits for an example. And this one little piece you were able to get one time and then they're never going to have it again. So this can look like different things. You really need to break down the core of what you're using and you need to follow up with those suppliers and be like, is this something you offer on the regular? Is there any chance you're going to discontinue this? How often do you get it in? The worst thing, one of the worst things you can do is put all this effort into starting this company that you want to grow and then not be able to get your supplies. And you can't pull that out of your ass. Like you can't pull supplies out of, if something's not being made anymore, it's not mm-hmm. an easy fix. So just have when these I, conversations. A lot of that supplies. happened after the, or during the pandemic, a lot of that was going on too. And it left a lot of small businesses scrambling and still people are scrambling to this day to try to find replacements for things, which I know that's an anomaly. Hopefully, knock on wood, we never have to experience that type of situation again in our lifetimes, but yeah, to do the best you can. Also, have backups if possible, as far as like maybe somebody you don't order 
every single time that you order on occasion, make sure they're, you know, supply is the standards that you have as far as quality, things like that, so that you have that um, as a backup just in case. Part of the reason we started Oh You're Lovely, you know, Stephanie and I were, Mm -hmm. Stephanie first and then I followed, we're both consumers of the product, these flowers, but they were so difficult to get and then you get it and your order would be smushed and half of it would be gone and the counts would be off that because we've had so much experience running our own small businesses, like I said, for about a cumulative of 20 years before we did this, that we knew how bad this was hurting the other ladies who own small businesses that were using the product. And we love our retail and retail is a huge part of our business, but we're really in love with the ladies who own these small businesses that we sell to. That is where our heart is. We will take messages and questions and make sure you have, we try so hard to have our core things all the time. We put in a lot of effort because we know how hard it can be when somebody doesn't have something and you need it. So that's the biggest reason we really started. Yeah, that was the whole, that was the whole reason. Right. Because we were tired to support other small businesses. And we knew, we knew somebody could do better for these ladies. So that's, I feel like we've been successful at that. And I hope you know, our wholesale customers so. feel like that too. There's, there's hiccups along the way sometimes that we have no control over and we try to then do our best either to suggest maybe this for right think now. Or, I mean, we've done all kinds of crazy things. I don't think our customers, they probably see like 2% of our hiccups. I think they do a really good job on hiding hiccups. <laughs> but any, the next one on my list of do's, I don't even think we'll need to say anything. Keep your books. Just keep your books. If you're not doing everything by credit card and digitally, you have to keep track of that stuff. You have to enter it in your QuickBooks. If you don't have a bookkeeper, that's fine, but you have to stay on top of it. Um, I have had friends who have been audited from like way, way, way long time ago and everything was paper and in boxes and we were able to get through it and I helped. But like if you don't keep track of that stuff, the government is not going to care and you will get fines and bills that you probably don't owe. Because if you can't prove what you're claiming as expenses, if you get audited, you're just shit out of luck. So just keep your books. Just do it on the regular. Don't get slack about it. Just do it. It's not fun. Not many people enjoy it except for accountants. But you gotta, <laughs> yeah, you got to work on that. I've, I've also, the past um, employer that I had, um, that I worked a lot of different positions within that company, they had been audited prior to me being there. But then I saw the what happened, the aftermath of being audited and what systems were in place. And we also, though, at that time was still, the internet was still, you know, pretty big, but he was very old school. So it was boxes and boxes and boxes of paper that I would have to go through on a regular basis and the filing systems and all of this other stuff. So it once you have a system in place, just stick with it. Yeah. And yeah, but it, if you let it sit, it's going to become overwhelming. So try your best not to let it sit. Just, just do it. So my last just do, do it. and it's not really a do, just, just kind of like a reminder is that you don't know how to do something. Just look it up on YouTube and don't just go and, and look at any video. You want somebody who's been around for a while, who has a significant amount of views and a good, you know, thumbs up versus the thumbs down. I mean, I still, I'm sure weekly Google how to do stuff. And it can be something easy, like how do you do this formula on a spreadsheet or this, this, and this. But don't, I don't like the, I don't know how to do it. Oh, well, just look it up. Just look it up. It's that easy. (laughs) Google is your best friend. YouTube is great. I will say, Maggie, you probably don't even know this. I don't think that the dislikes show up anymore on YouTube videos. They took that away. It just, only the... The maker of the video can see the the thumbs down, so you can only see the thumbs up, I believe. But I'll say my little add to that part is depending on what you're searching, look at the dates. When did they publish that video? Like if you're trying to figure out Facebook ads, for example, and you're looking at something from 2018, that's going to give you nothing. It's not going to give you – it might give you some foundation, very minimal, but so much stuff has changed. You want to stay current on current advice um, as things change. 
there's certain things that you can look at a video from years ago and it still is relevant today. But for the most part, technology stuff, things like that. Look at the dates when those videos go live. Also, sometimes creators in particular like to uh, just repurpose their content and they'll put it out like a couple years ago and then they'll make a new one that just changed the title. And that's not the truth. So yes. um, make sure to <laughs> take everything with a grain of salt. But you can't tell me almost anything if you have a question on how to do it, well, if you have the right search yeah. terms, you'll be able to find an answer or at least a, so a path to start let's going Let's move on down. to the don'ts. And I actually sure. don't have that many. I don't know what the statistic is, but I can guarantee you that most growing businesses at some point take that alone. Um, and through my business group, you know, I became close with lots of business owners that took out loans and different kinds of loans. Do not, and this is just our opinion again, do not ever take out a loan that the interest rate is not fixed. It, it's very common. It, it doesn't seem like it should be, but it's very common for businesses to do that because they're so desperate or this or that. And I actually know somebody <clears throat> close to somebody who took out a very big loan at a crazy interest rate, like 19%. You also really don't want to do that. It's hard as a new business to build up credit but it doesn't make any sense to dig a freaking hole because the interest rate's so high or it's not locked in. Um, you just, you know, I'll be so totally forthcoming. Over the last four years, we've had different kinds of loans, paid them off, took out new. It's not a big deal. <clears throat> but the last one we got, it was a, it was a pretty long drawn out process, and I was negotiating between multiple banks and. You know, sometimes that negotiating process also pays off. So I think don't rush, even if you feel like you need to rush, don't rush. And just don't, because I know, we know what that feels like. Oh, we just want to do this like thing. Let's do this thing. Don't make financial decisions off of that feeling because it's just not going to end up good. <laughs> if you know better and you're questioning it because you're excited, you just need don't do it. I would say too, the, the process of like shopping around, that is something that I probably would have never thought to do. I would have been like, well, this is my bank. I'm just going to ask a loan from my bank and I'm not going to like shop around to see if anybody can offer me a better rate. So that was something I learned in this whole process when we did that, that, well, yeah, why wouldn't you do that? It's no different than anything else. So yeah, shop around, yeah. be patient be calm about it, have some really, really, really honest mm -hmm. conversations with yourself. Or if you have, for us, it was us talking back and forth about it because of the partnership, but talk to mm -hmm. a mentor, somebody else's opinion that you really value, another small business owner. Um, if you're having some maybe questions of it, but be honest with yourself too in those situations. Because I... I don't necessarily, like for us, it was always kind of this conversation of when is the right time? You know, is it just because we want or do we need, like, do we want to be debt free? Is it okay? Like how much are we willing to take out versus that? like all those conversations have to be had and you have to have some real like tough conversations too. I think it's the same mm -hmm. as uh, any other type of relationship for us. Like if I wanted to take out a huge loan, right, exactly. I have to discuss it with my husband first. Like I can't just do it to do it. Like <laughs> so, it's one of those, and yeah. then we have to the pros and cons of it. And why all we right, do so it, the so. next don't, and this is I don't have anything else written down. So if you have some don'ts after this, but this could probably like tailspin into something else. Let's talk about social media okay. a little bit. <laughs> And again, you all, this is just oh, our God. opinion on things, but on social media and different platforms, there's ways you can advertise to get fake follows and likes and all this oh, stuff. And like this I'm just going to come out and say it. There's people in our industry who pay for fake likes on stuff. So it's really great if you land on a Facebook page and you see all their posts have hundreds and hundreds of likes and then you go to everybody else and they don't. It's fake. Those it maybe Stephanie, you can explain how it works a little more. But buying fake likes and follows, <clears throat> it's really just an image thing. You're really hurting the the algorithm and flow of your business page, and it's really to us our choice is that's a vanity thing. 
we've we've never done it we're not gonna do it um we don't want to pretend like we're something we don't but if you go on somebody's facebook page and they have hundreds of likes on everything and then they have a live video and they don't get more than you know a couple hundred views and like a handful of comments they're it's all fake and stephanie maybe you can talk about it a little more but like this is something as for us we feel really strongly about we're not interested in vanity we yeah. want to be seen for who we are what we built we don't want to pay for fake numbers on stuff yeah. um it's just to us it's not worth it it doesn't feel good no and then what we're talking about is facebook in particular which also ties into instagram a little bit because those two are linked but it comes to the ad spend and it comes to like either boosting a post or you can go in and you can directly ask so there's all these different groups of the type of ads you can run. And the ad can be just for engagement, um, which is where you're going to get a lot of likes. You're going to also get some very random kind of tags from all over the world sometimes. And what happens with those, at least in from the research that I've done, from the experience that I've had, from thing, like people I've talked to, is once you start doing things like that, and then you decide to stop, your organic mm -hmm. reach is going to plummet. And your organic reach is what you've been building up and you don't pay anything for that. You have to nurture it and be consistent um, and, po and post engaging content for people. However, that's something that you've done on your own and you haven't, your time is the money that is spent on that basically. Um, whereas if you're buying those engagements once you stop you're starting from the ground level basically of having to rebuild up that business because you have nobody that and actually that's is organically shows, engaged that's where it shows you. when people have live videos these people you know yes. thirty thousand likes or followers on their page and they have a live video and they have eight people watching i mean yeah that doesn't it, the the only part of it that it gives a, a potential for an image of being able to be a company that is trusted until you dig into it a little bit. Like if you just go to the page real quick and scan through and it's like, oh, they post on a regular basis. It seems like they've got engagement. But then if you go into the actual comments and the comments usually are very severely less than the amount of likes that are on that post. Yes. Um, there's, there's not a balance. There's a disconnect mm -hmm. that's happening. And if that's how you want to run your business, I guess that's your choice. That's your choice. But I for just us, feel like that's a lot. And we, we just want to be genuine. We just want to be seen for yeah. what we've built. We don't want to, there's no, like, we don't want to pretend to be something we're not. It doesn't feel good. Um, and yeah. we've been doing this for, and it doesn't help no. the business really. And we, we as Those consumers, aren't your customers. We as consumers see right through it because we've been doing this for so long and we know what that looks like. Yeah. And I don't think a lot of people yeah. do. So this this part of the conversation might feel weird to you guys, but for us, like it it doesn't make sense. We're never gonna do it. And yeah, it's just weird to us to like spend and that's just our opinion. Like, yep. So Steph, that's all in my don't I will, list. Do you have anything else? I think that's I think you covered everything as far as like <laughs> starting a good foundation and then some of the things not to necessarily you know do I'd love to see if anybody has any questions or anything mm -hmm. else as far as um a more deep dive into any of those or another topic as far as a, a do and a don't in those types of situations but I guess be honest be like consistent uh, get help, take team in those who know something way better than you would mm -hmm. um, to really build a good, solid foundation and a good team behind you. Uh, I do want to say just for legal purposes, all of this is opinion, opinion. only. We do not give out financial yeah. advice. No. We are not lawyers. No. <laughs> I don't think we talked anything about medical, but even that we're not doctors. <laughs> <laughs> this is pure opinion. Yes. Pure opinion, opinion. Pure nothing opinion. more, nothing yes. less. And no. guess what, guys? We're go. going to be dressed just like this in the next podcast because we're going to record the other one right now. So when you click on one, so there's another do now. batch. There's a there's a do for you batch content right. batch work. 
All right. I think that's all I got. The next one is going to probably yeah. be a little bit more vulnerable for us, um, a little bit more personal. Yeah. So if you're just curious, you might want to uh, come back in like two weeks and see if we post it the next one. Tune in for that one. Uh, as always, if you have any questions or a topic that you'd like to uh, listen to us ramble on about for a little <laughs> bit, you can send us an email at podcast at ohyourlovely.com. We also will take the questions that are dropped down below in the YouTube videos, and you can also ask your question there, and we will answer it in a later um, podcast. So mm-hmm. there you go. All right, you guys, have a lovely day. We will see you and talk to you super soon. Bye, guys. Bye.